Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to be back at Brown. Um, and I just, you know, after having moved away from New England several decades ago, I'm thrilled to be treated to a New England spring once again. <laughs> it brings back many, many memories. Um, so I want to talk today about digital memory and, in fact, about the whole implications of digital technology as the default form for our cultural and personal memory going into the future. And I want to focus in particular not on the technical issues that you face every day as scholars and librarians and archivists, but on the larger picture of the, you know, the context in which we think about memory and the role that it plays in our personal lives and in society at large. And I'm asking this question, what can we afford to lose? Because I remember in the analog world when the real question was, what can we afford to save? Because access to the sources of the resources to create and consume information were relatively scarce. I know it's, it's hard to believe in a library with so many volumes that it's scarce. But even the idea that you could publish a book and find a publisher, that happened only for a few people. And the distribution of those and the consumption of it depended upon the people who could actually gain physical access to those materials and actually could read and were allowed by law to read in many cases. So now we're faced with a technology which has, for all appearances, really lowered most barriers to producing information, to circulating information, and consuming information. So right now, at this point in digital stewardship, shall we say, the real question is, what can we afford to lose? Which is another way of saying, so how do we distinguish noise from signal? How do we know what has long-term value? What are the things that we use you know, very much today but may not turn out to be of long-term value. And as librarians and archivists, I think the real question is, how do we keep from making mistakes that our, you know, our successors curse us for, you know, not having captured something which is so important? Now, I, I first, before I start showing pretty pictures on the slide, I just want to talk about the reason I started asking these questions so you understand my priors and my perspective. The real reason, I mean, one of two reasons, the first is that as an historian, I was, of course, very concerned about the historical record upon which I am incredibly dependent. Um, and I am also aware as a student of medieval Russian history, where I studied archives controlled by Soviet archivists, how arbitrary is the keeping, preserving, and access to archives. So I know how fragile the historical record is, even in its physical form, and how easy it is to control. So I wanted to know what was going to happen in that respect. Um, and as someone who's working at the Library of Congress um, in the last century, actually, the last millennium, um, and aware that this was a library that collected not just print materials, but primarily primary source um, multimedia collections through a copyright deposit, that we were so far behind in even preserving 19th century media, like photography, that it was kind of shocking to think that we'd blown through audiovisual all the way to onion skin paper and, and cassette tapes, and now suddenly things were completely without material, seemingly without materiality at all. Um, and there was a lot more of it. Um, and the, the Library of Congress really was having a hard time understanding how it was still to be um, a universal collection, as Thomas Jefferson told, it, told them they should be, and how they were going to be universally accessible, um, and what constituted long-term value to begin with. Um, not to mention the fact that copyright deposit completely broke down in the digital age, and the library really doesn't get the Library of Congress doesn't get very robust digital deposit deposits anymore. Um, and I want to return at the end to my experience as a Russian historian because I think it goes to the um, to the real moral issues involved in how we build a record going forward. Um, just to review, for I mean I know you all know this, but just to review that the markers of long-term value in, um, in, the print, in the analog world, let's say, were fairly clear. There was the print. Um, these are things which are highly vetted. This is my bookshelf. Um, further curated um, by um, size, shall we say, <laughs> um, <coughs> and how they fit into the shelf. But you know, anything that got into print had, had some potential value for, long -term, uh, for the long term. And many libraries felt that way, which is why they collected so much. Um, but in the digital world, we don't even know what published means. We know that there are vetting forms, but even from a copyright perspective, something that's published um, is not yet versus unpublished is really unsettled, even in the copyright sphere. 
Um, so we know the value of highly vetted materials, which have been through many, many forms of filter and judgment. We know what we didn't like about the publishing world was what it filtered out. That the people who controlled the publishing industry did not publish the kinds of things that many communities felt they wanted documented about themselves and speaking to their own audience. And I don't need to go on about what that means today. Um, and we feel that's been liberated. We've been liberated from those constraints through the internet, that we have more access. But we've lost the filter. So that, in effect, everything is a kind of manuscript in many ways. Um, that is, everything um, is at, exists at a scale. Um, and much as we may want to continue the tradition of book publishing through e-books, I'm not sure that that's actually a form that is particularly native to the digital realm and will probably evolve a lot over time. What is the importance of manuscripts per se? Um, this is a rough draft of the Declaration of Independence um, held at the Library of Congress. And I just want to point out that um, this scribbling here, it's very important evidence about how the, you know, how the Declaration was made. Um, we are very conversant with this idea that, um, uh, that things are self-evident. Um, and in <coughs> fact, you'll see that that's not what, this is Jefferson's draft in his, in his exquisite handwriting. And his editors called John Adams and Benjamin Franklin came along and did great um, harm to his beautiful writing by actually editing it. And, and it was actually, um, it was Benjamin Franklin that um, came up with the idea of things being self-evident because, or it's being self-evident because Jefferson had written um, Sacred and Undeniable. So one of the things that's revealed about this just through the manuscript, which is a, which is a kind of, um, you know, um, you might say, you know, um, copying or something, um, uh, is, is how the, pr the very process of democracy itself, and the question is how do we reflect this kind of process of history making um, in a very compact and preservable way like, they, um, like there is in, in this form. Um, so the important thing about manuscripts, I'd say, is for those of us in, in the scholarly world is their form of evidence. Um, what does evidence look like today? Well, this is a machine that produces a lot of evidence. This is a Large Hadron Collider. And you can actually see, um, and I suppose I could walk over there since I'm not tethered. These are scientists in here. I don't know if you can see them, but actually that's the scale of the, of the inner workings of the Large Hadron Collider, which produces evidence for science. Science um, works with its own exquisite logic about the importance of evidence and producing it. But just to, talk, to, to give a sense of the scale that we're talking about now in the digital world, and here I actually have to read from my notes because I'll never remember these staggering numbers. So they, what they do is they photograph um, or they take data from collisions. And the raw data per collision event is around 1 million bytes um, per event, produced at a rate of about 600 million events per second. And they run this machine for you know months at a time. Um, now there's no, and I don't want to do the calculation about how much data that is for you. Um, it's important to understand that there's no intention that they will keep all of this data. This is produced in order to find evidence of what they're looking for. They will get rid of most of it, um, the large <coughs> part of it. Um, but in fact, their idea is that they will keep one byte in a million. One byte in a million, but how many millions of millions of millions do they create? And even their original plans and their revised plans for data storage are under, shall we say, intense pressure. Um, and what did they produce? I'm sorry, this is a comment about science. What did they produce? They produced what they thought was the Higgs boson, which meant that, gee, having found that answer, maybe they should be asking other questions, too. So this is all geared up to investigate other parts of, um, to, to perform other collisions. Now, the great thing about physicists, experimental physicists, and their buddies, the theoreticians, is that they will um, have a very clear idea uh, of what data they need and don't need. Um, and they may be right in the long run. They probably will be. Um, but astronomers do not have this very clear idea of what will be insignificant in the future, because they are, after all, photographing history. So in some sense, nothing is si insignificant. Um, the, this is a picture, um, a drawing, I should say, a mock-up of this um, square kilometer array. It's another tool created by human beings to discover facts about nature um, and for what I would call instrumental purposes, for the purpose of finding out more information. The difference is, as I said, that it records historical data. 
And um, as much as one exabyte, which is 10 to the 18 bytes of data per day. Now, it's true, it only keeps one petabyte a day. Excuse me, but it only keeps one petabyte a day. That's still a lot, and they still don't have really robust um, plans for how to store all this data, which is intrinsically important and already highly filtered just by having picked out you know, one petabyte. Um, as my good friend David Rosenthal, um, the technology expert, says, um, when he disagrees with me. No, Abby, the problem is not that they can't store all that data. It's that no one can afford to pay for its storage. And I think that's the real question. So, um, so this is, to my mind, raises the real question of, so what can we afford to lose? What can we afford to save? But what can we afford to lose? Because that's what it's going to look like nowadays, is the things that we throw away um, through neglect or because we don't preserve them. And we all know that we may be throwing away things that will turn out, in hindsight, to have been the wrong things to throw away. But I think we need to just get over that because it's inevitable. But the question of um, what the value of something is leads me to this whole question of um, what good is memory to begin with? And I say this, I mean, I, it does feel a little strange to say this to um, scholars in New England because you're surrounded by the past. And I now live in... San Francisco, where everyone is rushing into the future. One reason I wrote this book was to say, hey guys, you know, the past really does matter. But I do want to, um, I do want to get into a little bit of science about memory because I think neuroscience tells us a lot about how humans and all animals decide unconsciously what they can afford to ignore every day in an abundance of information. And I want to use this neuroscience as a kind of analogy for cultural memory and personal memory. Um, so, you know, there are essentially two types of, of memory that nature endows all creatures with. There's genetic memory, which is essentially, this is a DNA model. It tells a little thing how to grow up to be a big thing. It tells a, an amoeba how to grow up to be a, an amoeba and not a zebra. So it carries a lot of important information about what <coughs> something is going to become. And the great thing about DNA is it tells it what to become. It also produces a lot of failures. It's very imprecise. And it's the imprecision and redundancy of the gene which makes it so robust. And so w when a creature enters a, in, um, an environment that it needs to adjust to, um, it either dies or it actually can adapt well because it's carrying genes, information which it hadn't been able to use before, but will <coughs> in the future. So something I want you to take away from this kind of species memory is that it's highly redundant. It looks like it carries a lot of junk. In fact. Scientists used to call this information junk because they didn't know what it was yet. Now we know more about it. Um, and and a, an animal will generally carry a lot of what are called maladaptations, things that don't have any purpose in the particular environment that they're in. But I also want to point out that that's what saves lives and loses lives, that when mammals had for some reason to survive on land, they didn't grow legs to grow on land. They actually survived because they had these maladapted things called you know, limbs, which could grow into legs. And I would just want to make this point because we carry a lot of cultural junk in our archives. And, and a, a lot of people will challenge us about the importance of the information that we carry because it's superseded and obsolescent. And as, as far as nature is concerned, there is no such thing as superseded and obsolescent information because it, we never know when we'll need it to adapt to the environment. So I think the species you know, metaphor is like our cultural memory, that in fact we should be carrying far more obsolete information than we know what to do with. Um, and I think we need to make that point that it is worth the investment that we've already made in it to carry it forward. The other kind of uh, memory that nature endows us with is each creature has the ability to learn. This is one of the... Um, sort of darlings of a neuroscience I learned as a historian. This is um, in a plesia. It's a, sea it's a sea slug studied by some famous um, memory scientists, neuroscientists like Eric Kandel and others, because it, it had really big nerves. They could study really easily. Um, and what they learned from this animal and others is that um, the kind of memory that all li living creatures have to adapt to the environment is um, what, the, what scientists call learning, which is the ability for a creature to be physically modified by its environment and its experience. Like all of us are actually physically, chemically, electrochemically modified by our, our experience as we, as we grow up. And the analogy in the cultural and sort of 
um, human sphere is that we are very much creatures of the worlds in which we grow up. Um, it is, um, it's the world in which we grow up that tells us what kind of food we like, what kind of food we're, we eat, what kind of languages we speak. I think in general the things that many of us take as the most intimate possessions of our personality, our, our preferences for things, are in fact endowments of this larger culture that we take in when we're young. Um, and, and tends to be very exclusive and identified very closely with ourselves and our, our identity. And as we go through a period of time in human history when cultures need to, are butting up against each other and they come from very different cultures, we need to have a fair amount of, um, I think, forgiveness of each other's intolerance because we are actually engineered to be um, very tribal and insulated and to recognize one, you know, kinds of ourselves. Um, and it's one of the great um, gifts of cu sharing cultural memory, that it's a way that we can actually break down some of these sort of biologically engineered barriers to actually, um, that we learn at a very young age and we can't technically unlearn about um, changing environments. So I want to now move to a more familiar space, which is um, the third kind of memory, which humans, uh, humans invented, you know, humans, nature's never good enough, we have to improve on it. So we invented these technologies that actually expand and amplify our memory. This is one of the earliest surviving um, forms of memory technology where we inscribe what we know. It's a cuneiform. It's only about 2,300 years old, um, I say only, um, but there are some that are much, much older. Um, this is in the British Museum. And I just want to point out to um, all, the, all of us in the room who may not appreciate people in the, um, in the business world except around tax time. You could say that, that um, it, you know, civilization was invented by accountants because they were the ones who invented writing. They were the ones who were charged with keeping account of the vats of, oils, of vats of oil traded, sheep, etc. And most early cuneiforms are largely accountability for physical objects and exchanges. It enabled trade. Um, which is the, the, you know, one of the keys of human civilization, human society is trading, trust among strangers. These became proxy tokens of trust, which unlike digital tokens of trust, <coughs> cannot be tampered with without leaving a physical trace, incidentally. Um, so tokens of trust have gone downhill. But you know, we can't ever keep a good technology down. Um, it didn't take long for people to discover very personal uses of this technology when they were allowed access to it. This close-up shows you, I don't read this, but um, quite miraculously, people do read this. Um, another clue about longevity of knowledge in, in our world is that we actually have the ability to decipher dead languages. So let's not assume that dead computer languages are actually going to be dead for very long. If we can read this, I think we'll be able to read anything in any computer format at some point. But this is actually um, an interpretation of omens um, of um, birth defects among both animals and, and, um, and humans. So very early on, this technology of accountability was domesticated basically for um, prophecy, um, for propaganda. Um, there, there most, many of the things that were written were about kings and their great deeds. And then, of course, for poetry. The first po existing poem we have is um, Gilgamesh, written in this, in this form, written incidentally about a man who wanted to live forever. Um, so I want to talk next about um, another, another technology which arose for also extremely practical reasons that turned out to have many different implications. And I'm talking about these technologies you're familiar with because we seem to be so sensitive to how radically different um, and hard <laughs> to adjust to digital technology is. But I really think it's a very minor disruption compared to some of these others, particularly those created in the 19th century. So this is the Gutenberg Bible, printed in the 18, uh, sorry, the 18, the, uh, the 1450s, in a town we think called Mainz. And it took, uh, let me just um, refresh my memory here. So it took, um, it took the scribes about, we, we think about the people who produced this, who were goldsmiths, took about four or five years to produce 180 copies that we know of. Um, and um, they responded to, they didn't do this because they wanted to invent some newfangled thing. They were actually de responding to a market demand for the old fangle thing, which was very rare, which is this, the giant Bible of Mainz, produced in the same town, probably the same years. It took scribes one year to produce this. Um, 
um, but they produced only one copy. And so what Gutenberg was doing was creating an almost perfect facsimile, you might, see, might say. Um, and it's perfectly natural for a new technology to mask itself as the old technology. Um, and for old genres to persist into the new genre. It really took quite a long time, I'd say at least 100 years before there were enough print, s print natives to actually look at the print as a given and start experimenting and discovering new, new ways of releasing new human potentials, shall we say. And my poster child for the human potential of um, print is Michel de Montaigne, who was a print native, came Mm, was born about a hundred years, just under a hundred years after print was invented in Germany. He was French, of course, and, and print was fairly common by then among people of his class. And he wrote, he wrote essays. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the essays. And what what's seems so significant to me about his essays is that he really is one of the first people you can turn to who say that he was an author that never would have existed in the old form. He wrote a form, the essay, which was a personal essay, and he very disingenuously says in his introduction that he writes this so that he may be remembered by his family. Um, but in fact, if he wanted to be remembered by his family, he would have written letters to them, and he wouldn't have published them and circulated them and, and produced many different editions of it. Instead, he was really interested in creating a new readership, a new authorship, um, and a whole new way of humans exploring themselves through this form, the essay. So, so I, so, um, I want to talk about the risks of moving from technologies that enable us to remember things, the risk of actually um, of neglecting what we have, a, a kind of risk of cultural amnesia. Um, I just want to refer briefly to the story you all know, at least one version or another, the myth of the Library of Alexandria, that it was somehow destroyed by war or that, that it comprehended all of ancient knowledge um, and was destroyed through war when it was destroyed many times by war, but it was always replenished as well. So to make a long story short, it was actually, it went into a kind of slow decay um, that both the Christians who took over Alexandria and then later um, the caliphates, they either actively destroyed some of these manuscripts or they simply neglected them because they had introduced this new kind of culture of a new sort of ideological monoculture which had no use whatsoever for classical learning. And so the, most of the manuscripts sort of disappeared and dis, um, dissipated, which is why we have some that have survived through dissipation. So there was this kind of cultural amnesia that took over uh, um, in Western, in the West, let's say. Um, and I, I have this picture of Iris Murdoch because to me she's a very um, moving example of what happens to a culture and an extraordinarily creative human being who begins to lose their memory. So she was a victim of Alzheimer's. There, this picture was taken probably at the onset of Alzheimer's. And the, the significant story here is not that she lost her memory. Um, it's that she became physically disoriented about where she was, because she had no idea of where she, you know, she didn't know the past, so she didn't know where she was. She'd wake up in the morning and not know what to do. But most significantly, she was unable to imagine anything. She couldn't write, and she had no imagination whatsoever which tells me that memory actually, as the little sea slug knows, um, memory is not about the past. It is about the future. Imagination really is about memory in the future tense. And the whole purpose of memory, of remembering things, is so that the brain can build this model of the world or through cultural resources. We have a cultural model of what is right and wrong in the world. And we can make predictions about what's going to happen. Uh, and we can make very... Um, robust predictions about what can happen. And, and without that understanding of memory as being the very crux of conjectural thinking, you would not, I don't think you'd, you'd be able to appreciate how contingent all of scientific thought is, you know, our pride and glory in the West. All scientific thought is on this whole idea of the past being a tool for predicting the future. We would have no engineers that could build bridges, for example, if that were not the case. Um, I want to I want to raise um, the no, focus now on some of the moral issues about um, about stewardship of this cultural memory in the do, in the digital age in particular. Um, I want to um, point in particular to the fact that um, we have um, just a second. Um,
that to, in a very real sense, memory is, um, as many neuro neuroscientists have said, memory is the crux of consciousness because it is our tool for intentionality. We don't know whether un uh, other animals have intentionality in the way humans understand it. They may if they have the capacity to mem remember the way we do. But I want to segue to a more um, personal experience I have in cultural amnesia. That's me many years ago, it was in 1983 actually, dressed for the weather. I don't know if you all can see in the back, but I'm standing in Red Square. Um, this line in the back are good Soviet citizens lined up to go into the tomb, and that's Lenin's tomb. It snaked around for over a mile around the wall of the Kremlin. That would be normal. It was about, you know, the temperature was much lower now then than it was now. Um, I spent a year there doing research in medieval, in the medieval archives. And I was not granted access to very many materials because of the country I was from. Um, I worked in a country that believed that information was the property of the state and they could decide who could have access to it, including their citizens. So in fact, I knew much more about the history of their country than most Soviet citizens. I believed I did, um, and it was right. And I would fret about the future of my life and other things in a way that my Soviet friends never could fret. They would laugh and say, Abby, you Westerners, you always worry about the future. You know, we never worry about the future. The future is known to us. It's the past that's always changing. Uh, and I think that, you know, this, this explains why we have a man like Putin, that when suddenly the past was revealed to these people, um, it was so disorienting that they actually didn't know who they were anymore. And I won't go on about all the implications of that. We can talk about that, if you'd like, later. Um, but I want to talk about the, the extreme fragility of the digital record. I published book, this book a year ago, and a year ago I could never say, you all now know how fragile the digital record is and how easy it is for people who preoccupy the digital space to, to create false pasts. I mean, we call them false narratives. But they pass for the truth because we tell people what they want to hear, what makes sense of the present age. So how do we keep the historical record from becoming like this? And so I want to focus now, if I can, on purely going forward the digital, the born digital collecting. Um, how do we keep from creating a record that's kind of like this, um, sort of pixelated and not quite making sense? Um, and I want to talk about this amorphous thing we call communities, because I think, in, at least in the near term, um, embedding digital tools within communities to, to create their own documentation and access tools for history is going to be an important stopgap if it's not the most robust form of collecting in the future. Um, I want to um, uh, you know, um, give all credit to historians who have known from the beginning that the way to document their communities if, um, if major libraries and institutions don't is to document it themselves. So you may recognize this picture of Carter Woodson known to many as um, the father of African-American history. I must say, as someone working in the Library of Congress who had many of his papers, um, the library had many of his papers, he was known to us as the father of, um, you know, of African-American librarianship. Because in order to do his work, he actually had to go out and collect um, materials that were held in the African-American community, but in, in people's homes not in institutions um, of scholarship and learning. So he actually gathered them together, and then he deeded them to many different institutions, not just the Library of Congress, where they could be used for the purposes in which he intended them to be used, and for many other purposes since. So what's an analogy of someone like Carter Woodson? I'd say, um, regrettably, there are very few that I can point to, but I will use this man as a poster child. This is Brewster Kale. Uh, uh, um, geek at his machines. This is the Internet Archive, um, a very old picture of the Internet Archive. But I chose this one with his machines because I want you to see that, you know, this is the new shelving for books, audio, and video. Um, you know, there's no browsability in this library, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, and so all these formats exist on the, same, on the same medium, which means that it's very easy for one archive to, to forget about their expertise in what format they, they are expert in, but actually start collecting in all media, which is how we express ourselves. Now, Brewster makes it possible for people to upload whatever they want, essentially whatever they want, onto the archive. And I understand many um, universities use this tool, I'm sure Brown uses many things like this, to archive things that librarians and archivists, and perhaps some scholars, say are important for collecting. But I think 
for humanists in particular, we need to think much broader than the campus. We need to be thinking about how it is we get um, not just what our community knows it's interested in, but actually how to collect the kind of, embed the kind of documentation in communities that we know that scholars 100 years from now will want to be studying that are not privileged by libraries um, that we um, live with all the time, that we inhabit. So, you know, the very, the last thing I want to um, end up with is a, a plea, shall we say, for, um, for the one thing that I fear the most, and I actually fear it in some ways um, being a particular problem of universities in the West, and that is what I call this threat of an, of an intellectual monoculture. Um, and I introduced that term when I was talking about um, what religions did to the Alexandria Library. But I think in a world that's highly secular, secularized as, it, as ours is, we have different forms of these, uh, ideo you know, these sort of ideological and intellectual monocultures. Um, I'd say that um, we are uh, very wedded to s certain specific types of facts. Um, and we certainly know that there's a reaction in, in, um, in, in America to, the, um, to experts defining what facts are for us. And it's a, very sen it's a very interesting time to think about how we document what's going on, how we as scholars and, and librarians and archivists actually think about the resources we need to be collecting now that will help people in the future understand what happened in the past couple of years. If it took us by surprise, and maybe it took nobody in this room by surprise, what happened in, in 2016, um, but it took many people by surprise. It certainly took me by surprise. And I'm ashamed of that, actually, that I hadn't really, I mean, what bubble do I live in? Now, I shouldn't say I'm, I'm ashamed, but I'm saying it, to me, it's a wake-up call that we need to be documenting the, the communities that we actually feel the least um, comfortable with, let's say, in, a, in a, uh, uncertain campuses, actually in many parts of the world. Um, and I don't know how we go about that, but I do know as an historian, it's critical that we start doing this. I was talking to a woman um, at a woman's archive who was saying that, as a historian, she knew how critically important it was that she be collecting, for example, the papers of Kellyanne Conway, Kellyanne Conway um, but that her donors would absolutely scream if they found out that um, she was doing it um, because they, were imbe you know, they, they came from a different tradition and, and they wanted to own all of that, all that. So I think as we go forward, and, and an archive can define itself any way it wants, but I think as we go forward, we need to start thinking about an ecosystem of <coughs> digital collecting webs that, if, that we can specialize in. I use we, you know, sort of generically. Um, and that, um, that we actually develop these community-based um, approaches to web archiving that um, if we don't collect comprehensively in the area of, of women's activism, right and left, for example, and that's just an example, that we have a network where we know there is, there is um, right and left, right collecting, and there's left collecting, and that they are networked together. Um, so I think we can declare our interests and our expertise. Um, but it takes a lot of thought. And, and one of the things that I know about librarians for many years working in libraries is, if it's any place that people feel safe, where you can go in and have a conversation where people want to pursue the truth as opposed to pursue each other, it's in a library. Um, and it's one of the few spaces on campus and anywhere in the United States, and I'll just speak to the experience I, I know by saying the United States, where people really feel that it is a safe zone from many different points of view. Um, and if that's ever under threat, then I know that librarians will actively resist that threat. So I think it's, a, it's the best place we can start to have some of these conversations. And I don't mean to solve social problems today. I mean to think seriously about it creating creating an honest record of what's happening now that will enlighten all the people who come after us so that we can really have an honest account, a sort of more um, comprehensive account about the times that we are going through. You know, when we think about what we want to preserve, um, and I'm going to end with this picture of um, Socrates, um, who thought that, in fact, writing was going to be the death of memory to begin with. Um, I always disagree with him. But he did make this point that once we start inscribing our memory, outsourcing it into, into physical objects that we have no control over, 
we do lose some responsibility, some sense of responsibility for the materials that we, that the knowledge that we actually have. And I would, st I would say that we actually need to be um, mindful of how we collect information, how we control, the, control its flows. But it is better to write something down and document it than to leave such huge gaps in the record that, um, that, that we could have going forward. So I just want to leave, this, um, leave you with this thought that I think it will be very difficult to have conversations with any group, no matter how much of goodwill, to, th to have a, engage conversations with scholars and scientists about the kinds of collections that they think are going to be important because they're not used to thinking very long term in the future. You know, we're one of the libraries are one of the few communities that when they say they're working on behalf of users, they mean users in the past, users in the present, and users in the future. And one of our, uh, I, I'm saying our, like generously including me in this community of librarians and archivists um, and fans, but I think one of our great um, strengths is our ability to lift people's eyes up past the immediate future, immediate present, into the future, and think about responsibilities to those people coming and using the library and archives in the future. And I think when we have conversations <coughs> with faculty about what kinds of curation they want, to help them think about the information that they value now, and honestly, what do they think that 50 years from now they really want to be known by? So there's, the in, there's, there's thinking about what do we want people to know about ourselves? That, that much we can control. But what do we think people will want to know about us in the future? That's a matter of speculation. And I think that librarians and archivists have a unique perspective and guiding role to play here and elsewhere throughout the country on how we think about what we can afford to lose. So thank you very much. <laughs> I know you have questions, but I also wanted to leave you with this. Um, uh, note that um, we've been doing these these uh, selfies since Paleolithic times. So, um, vanity is is the uh, is the at the core of collecting, I think. So I'm happy to take any questions, and in particular, if there are topics that I I glossed over, things you disagree with, or things that you wish I had asked, I talked further about. I'd be happy to address. Yes. Um, it, it is really. I feel it's really important to collect things. Um, David McCauley wrote a book called Motel of the Mysteries, mm -hmm. um, where it was an archaeological discovery, and he found things without context, right? And the book is, is funny, you know, someone has a toilet seat around their neck, because that was thought to be some sort of, um, you know, uh -huh. thing, thing, thing that you would wear with pride. Um, so when we're collecting things, what is our obligation to be collecting the context? You're talking about you know, collecting social mm -hmm. issues of today, and if you download websites and archive them without mm -hmm. context, um, are we going to be sharing those as reality in 100 years? Um, that's the, the very, very important question. And in fact, it goes to the very heart of what has long-term value. We actually don't know the value of anything until, until way in the future because its actual meaning is determined by events and context that we don't know about. Um, so I would say, um, since we don't know, we can, it's really important for us to document the losers as well as the winners. But the context, given scale, I'd say at this stage when we can't make any definitive decisions about what's going to be important what isn't, even if we could, we shouldn't, um, I'd say that that's where collecting at the depth that you can with the capacity that you can, and you know, it takes a lot of energy to do these things, or bandwidth, I should say, roughly speaking, um, that instead of trying to collect a, a really large context, this is where actually networking with people um, or organizations that have similar or tangent collecting interests may help. Because if you, if you collect in what seems to you a, a full enough context, knowing it will never be totally full, um, and link and provide some network to um, something that supplements the context for that, that might help. And that's the closest I can give you to an answer because I actually don't know the answer. Um, you know, we can't prevent people from misreading things. Um, and that's, you know, we shouldn't try necessarily. Um, but I also think that we shouldn't err on the side of telling people, being too directive about how to read things too. 
Yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, you and then you. <laughs> so thank you <coughs> for speaking today. Uh, so you mentioned that you know the internet has lowered barriers for communication. It's also fragile and, and um, it's been a part of your scholarship. But I think with digital preservationists, there's this tension between um, the fact that this, this information is public and people are putting this out, out for anyone to see and whether, what are the ethics of collecting that information? Um, be, since it is fragile, we do kind of feel as though there's a responsibility to collect it before it's gone. But on the other hand, there are certainly conversations and work being done on the internet that may not want to be collected. You know, I think about social justice movements who do a lot of organizing or a lot of thinking on the internet and may not do that with the concept of, oh, this will become, this will become part of an institution someday, part of a collection that will, as, as Carrie was mentioning, contextualize our work in a way that maybe, you know, you're, you were talking about Carter Whitson, he, he got to help define the context of the collection for his community. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important part of community archives. But if institutions are going out and collecting these communities' work without any sort of um, uh, running any sort of interference with those communities, there, there, there becomes these sticky points. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about kind of that tension of, of the fragility of, of wanting to collect something before it's gone, but also wanting to be ethical and not feel as though uh, we have a right to that information um, in those stories, necessarily? Uh, it's a very important question. Um, and I, I wish I could answer as I would have even, you know, 15 years ago saying, well, you know, it's just you collect it and then you embargo it for a long time and then you make it accessible. I mean, print archives do this all the time, you know, analog based do all the time. Um, but the truth is that you will not actually have anything if you don't collect it now. So I, mean, I know this is a very fine ethical issue, but I say collect it now. If you have to keep it in a dark archive, fine. Um, and I know dark archives is anathema to many people. Um, let's say dim archive. Um, but I, I really believe that, um, that we can't just ignore these things because we believe that everything we collect we need to make accessible right now. I, I mean, I just don't believe that. Um, I really think that we should be collecting. I don't know how many of these organizations you have approached and um, what their specific problems are. Um, I do think that an organization that um, affects, that, that aspires to change society um, declares itself an historical actor sort of in advance. And I think, frankly, I think we have every right to collect their materials. Um, but I think that an institution um, can make clear that it's not going to be institutionalized in the negative sense that you, you know, it's, I mean, anybody who's negotiated with um, paper donations know donors put the most incredible restrictions on things. Um, and we no longer accept, we, we know there's only one that we won't accept anymore, which is they never get re revealed. There always has to be some time frame or some circumstance that triggers it. So I would be aggressive about collecting if you think it's going to be of significance in the long term. And I would take the time, if you have it, to have that conversation. And if they refuse, um, then there's nothing you can do about it. But then they'll end up, as Lenin used to say, on the trash heap of history, unfortunately. So, and few, few people like to think of themselves that way. And there is always the option of doing outreach to those communities and, and helping <coughs> give them the tools. You can give them the tools, them. right. Yeah, actually, that, that is a much better um, approach. And in fact, I think as people start collecting digital papers of individuals, we're going to have to start it approaching those individuals very early in their career, as soon as we, they get on our radar screen and hand them a toolkit. You know, like, hey, press that button, archive it, because otherwise they won't be saving many of these things. Yes, and, uh, sorry, there was a second question. Uh -huh. yes. um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so um, my question is, because digital um, archiving is, or like keep, keeping memory in the digital form is thought to be more like convenient, and it takes nice place, and you can, more, but also, do you see the dangers of um, of like relying on like digital um, media? So, for example, I think a couple of years ago, the U uh, British government stopped um, archiving or like putting records on parchment, and because it was like cost and like also ethical issues on like parchment. But the argument was that parchment is like actually a more long-lasting, good quality paper or material to write on. So um, do you 
see those tensions and dangers of relying on digital media? Uh, yeah, digital media are very ephemeral. Um, but I think if the only thing that human beings cared about um, was longevity, we'd still be reusing cuneiforms. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I somehow, I, I, I take this all with a, um, there's what we would like to see, and then there's what's going to happen and how we deal with it. So I think that talking about the digital as optional, that's like a conversation from 20 years ago. Um, if the world is digital, and I think we need to figure out how to, how to make it stable. And I think a lot of the early efforts in trying to come up with formats like PDFs that looked very bookish, um, but didn't have very many of the affordances of, of the digital technology that people actually want to use, um, may or may not turn out to be the best way. I think for documents, that it may well be, um, particularly since they're amenable to making archival format uh, PDFs. Um, part of our problem as librarians and archivists, historians in general, is that um, it's the commercial companies that own these, that develop these platforms and um, that own them. And as long as that's the case, um, we're going to have to adapt ourselves to their, you know, whatever they tell us to do. Um, so I would say um, that we need to be far more proactive as consumers and not just, you know, institutions, but as consumers. Um, that we have long term, we have, you know, real contracts with things like the iCloud about how we get the materials back from the iCloud if we put it up there. Um, that's just having to do with personal memory. I think that more institutions ought to have their own clouds under their own control. Um, I mean, Amazon Tree is a wonderful um, thing, but I really think we ought to be having our own um, clouds as well. But I, I think, I don't know, I really struggled with this uh, when I was writing the book because I thought um, there was no way that, in fact, we could, ever be, we could ever stabilize this. But it took me so darn long to write the book, and there were so many amazing things that happened in the course of that time, where they, there were these amazing stories of people actually, oh yeah, preserving this, and of doing amazing digital forensics, means taking you know, old formats and actually excavating the information from them. So I really think that if, um, I really had this, it's not blind faith, but I had this idea that if we, if the demand is there, technologists are really amazingly clever at solving problems with the technologies they create. We can never expect them to anticipate what we want our, their technologies to do. And we certainly don't have to adopt the technologies that they think are really cool. Um, but I think as, at least in, in, for libraries and archives, we need to be following what users are doing. And I think any attempt to tell users what to do and create forms for them that, you know, we know how to save, and if you do it this way, it'll save, it's not a long-term solution. So I think we need to figure out what users really want and figure out how to stabilize that. Um, we were having a conversation earlier about um, how, how people consume information these days. And I mentioned YouTube. And there's much to be said against YouTube, except, except that it's YouTube. Um, and people spend a lot of time on it. But if people like it, and if scholars and students spend time there, then we ought to be thinking about creating a very kind of stable YouTube-like platform for dissemination of information. Um, again, you know, whenever I talk to my friend David Rosenthal, who I think is one of the m shrewdest um, and most cynical people on the area of digital technologies, when I raise these objections, he, he looks at me like I'm such a naive child. You know, like, well, of course we can solve this problem. That's not the problem. The problem is that nobody's demanding it and nobody's going to pay for it. And I think that's really the fundamental problem. That's certainly an economic problem, the demand for digital preservation is at this stage in our, in our culture so low that there, are no, there aren't even any good consumer technologies for saving family photos or sorting them, um, short of what you know, your Apple machine provides. Um, and that's really, that's, that's up to us as consumers to demand that we have more of these. I don't, this is not the question you asked, but I think that the academy um, and research in general can come up with some very cutting edge solutions for preservation. But I think given the country that we live in and the economic situation we live in, it will be for the next uh, several decades, it will be the private sector that develops these, um, these solutions because they're the ones that can afford to do so at scale. And we need to have a better relationship with some of these technologies and some of the companies um, so that we can make sure that we work with them to take the formats that they create and that we adore uh, sort of archival friendly over time. That, that's not actually a don't worry about it, it's going to be OK answer. It, it really, th there really is a tension. But I think the answer to the first, for the first part of your question about this tension is 
people, people have automatically, they've already decided they want more information faster in more formats than durability. We've already made that decision. And so we need to go there <coughs> and figure out how to make those things as durable as possible. It's hard when we don't know what we want to make durable, want, want to persist. Um, government records, I think, is a good place to start. We definitely know we want government records. So there are some things we know. Um, and, and you know, the National Archives is working on archive format friendly um, things for government records. But then you get into the compliance issue. So I do think it's a solvable problem. But I think, again, it's a social problem. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question about the relationship between some of the archiving and, uh, say, uh, personal, um, you know, let's say, privacy issues. Uh, I'm a retired professor uh, a few years ago. What field are you in? Uh, well, I'm in mathematics, or in general, but uh, in mathematics. I'm working uh, with four separate archivists now, including the Archivist of American Mathematics, Professional Archives, and uh, Archives for well, different kinds of things, but I'm working with two archivists here at Brown and two other universities as well, uh, just to try to figure out where these different things should go. I'm a saver, unfortunately. Oh, no, we love savings. Oh, uh, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you, you should have been around when we were downsizing. You know. uh, but, uh, example, I, I have every uh, letter of recommendation, a copy of letter, every letter of recommendation I've written for the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, three years ago, I gave a number of uh, records to Brown, including collections of uh, letters of recommendation. I brought in a, another couple of boxes just recently, and it said the rule has changed, the law has changed. Uh, we no longer keep records of even keeping them for 50 years from now. We don't keep records of student recommendations or evaluations anymore. Is it a privacy issue? Well, I don't know whether it's privacy or not, but I suspect that's part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a dean when the Buckley Amendment came in. We had records all over the place mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. had to be redone because uh, well, different access to records by yeah. the people who were involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I see this changing all the time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting getting involved with archivists. I'm trying to get a lot of my colleagues to be archival and think about the mission things they've saved and where that could go to help keep track of what happened in, in the late 20th century. So, you know, one of the, uh, so, I, I mean, I take it that part of what you're asking is, um, so what do you do about the fact that archives keep changing their criteria or, you know, what's yeah. best? Yeah, um, and all I can, you know, I, there's nothing we can do about that except acknowledge that archives are institutions run by human beings and things change over time. Um, and you're the best judge of what's important or not. Um, I know um, the, spe the sort of archival collections I'm most familiar with were at the Library of Congress where they had, yes, they had ever-changing, um, not ever-changing, but slowly changing criteria about access and about collecting. And actually, in some t cases, gave collections back to institutions. Um, and that has a lot to do with changing perceptions of value over time. Um, like I said, we actually don't know the long-term value of something until much time has passed. But if you're looking um, for an institution that cares about that kind of thing, then um, and and Brown isn't it, or um, then something else. I mean, you know, there are many different kinds of archives with many different collecting criteria. I can't answer your specific question, and if it's a legal issue of privacy, then I don't know what to say about that. It's a legal issue of privacy. Um, but given that you wrote, re I'm just sort of vamping here, but letters of recommendation to students might be of interest um, to the mathematical society um, because after all, some of them may have gone on to become eminent mathematicians, presumably. Um, so I think you know, every, the genius of a, of a really great archives and special collections library is they, don't do, they aren't all things to all people. Um, they are something very special to a lot of very special people. And I actually applaud, what, you know, when, a, when an archives tells you, sorry, that's not within scope, um, it's a good thing for them to know what their scope is. Um, and they should be able to tell you where something is in scope and to give a recommendation about where to go. So I would ask the colleagues, you know, your colleagues at Brown, again, so where do we go? Where would you, where would you advise me to go from here? And please, if you could get more of your colleagues to be thinking about younger colleagues to be thinking about um, 
the importance of their record for the history of their discipline over time and start taking care. I know it's still a print-based culture, right? Mathematics? Well, except it's, it's all, it's all uh, Except it's all digital, right? Yeah. yeah, right, okay, okay. I know we're, we're um, at or over time, and I'm happy to, I'm gonna, I can stay for questions and. Yeah, so, yeah. so we still have, um, we have some more time with Abby, but um, for more informal conversation, but please join me in thanking her for her brilliant talk.